So that's, that's been good news. For those of you who are new, this is your first event. I want to thank you for taking time out of your, your week to come uh, take us out to the test drive and see what you've found as part of your group. Each and every day, you all the events because the people here share your value. In terms of word libertarian, what is word libertarian? The word libertarian comes from the root word liberty, individual liberty and personal responsibility. And there, there, very, 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 there. Very short. 
conventional wisdom is not that right. Mr. Brown went on to write 13 different books, including three bestsellers. Among his books are You Can Profit from a Monetary Crisis and my personal favorite, How I Found Freedom in the Free World. If you haven't read that book, you are in for a treat, because it will show you how to get back your life and be responsible and be self-reliant and not have to worry about whether the rest of the world does not see you. So you should always look at the third while you're practicing the book. <laughs> in 1996, Harry Brown, 1995, he wrote a book called Why Government Doesn't Work. It was a campaign book. By the way, some of the people read Why Government Doesn't Work. Getting the government out of all of the decisions that it presumes to make. 
was diagnosed as having chronic euphoria <laughs> with Pollyanna syndrome. <laughs> but I believe that there is good reason to think that we will have a libertarian president and a libertarian Congress before the end of this decade. Now, I'm not promising it. I'm not guaranteeing it. I'm not even predicting it. But I can see how it can happen. Look at what has come to the Republicans and the Democrats. They have reached the point where they can no longer go to one group of people and say, hey, we're going to give you this wonderful subsidy, we're going to double your income, we're going to give you all kinds of privileges, and we're going to spread the cost over all these people and they'll never even know what happened to them. And then come over here and say, we've got a deal for you, we're going to do something for you that's going to change your life for the better, and we're going to spread the cost over all these people, and they'll never know what they're paying, what they're doing, and so forth. They used to be able to do that. They did Thank you. 
know for sure that we can, but it's, the chances are too great for me to turn and walk away from it. How many, I'm, I'm 67 years old. How many can? What, 20, 30 years maybe we'll live home and home. Maybe 40 if we could get rid of the FDA. <laughs>
all of these different concerns. There is an answer, a single answer to all of these possibilities that people raise to you. And that is to simply ask the question, do you want smaller government? And it is amazing that people talk about this, that, and everything else, and they never come to grips with that question. The answer is obvious. 90% of the people to whom you pose that question will say, of course, government is way too big. The question is, do you want smaller government? And if you want smaller government, the obvious first step is to quit supporting the people who are bringing you big government. And that's all there is. Happy Canada is not made a single 
another government program. It's going to be another layer of government on your life, and it's not going to work any better than any of the previous government programs. When he talks about immigration, it may sound great that he's going to keep out of the country the people that he don't want to be in the country. But the fact of the matter is, it isn't going to keep anybody out. All it's going to do is make you carry an identity card or your employer go to jail for inadvertently hiring an illegal alien. But they're still going to come across the border and pack your can and nose as well as you and I do. All of them are talking about more government. Nobody is talking about smaller government except us. We do have the strongest, most powerful political message in the world. And once we can help people identify that what they really want is smaller government, then they will come to us. And so I believe that we do have that rainbow looking ahead of us. Sometime in this decade, and I believe that at the end of that rainbow is a wonderful America. America, not just the America that you and I have dreamed of, but because of the nature of freedom, it will possess so many things that we don't even think about today, so many things that we couldn't even possibly describe to people, so many things we couldn't identify, because so many people will be free to pursue their dreams in ways that will help us. They will make their money by doing things for us that we can't even imagine today. And there will be so many uneconomic jobs, uh, non-economic benefits, so many things such as the stability, the, the benevolence that will exist in a free society that can't possibly exist in the kind of society we have now. Let me give you, as a final word, one analogy. Suppose you have a Windows computer and your neighbor has a Mac. Well, you may argue about which operating system is better. And the argument may even get a little heated sometimes. But it doesn't turn you into enemies. And it's true that if this computer crashes, you may pop open a bottle of champagne and sell it. <laughs> but the fact is that you still don't believe that he's your enemy or your opponent or anything else. It's still a friendly argument. But what if you want prayer in the school and he doesn't want prayer in the school? You have to go down to the Board of Education and fight each other because you can't have what you want if he gets what he wants. You can have a Mac, he can have a Windows computer, or vice versa. Neither one gets in the way of the other. But if you want sex education in the school and he doesn't, if you want one kind of curriculum and he doesn't, you've got to fight each other. Because government is a monopoly, and that monopoly is imposed upon everyone. And it means that people who should be your friends are your opponents and your enemies, because you can't get what you want unless they're denied what they want. And the result of that is that gays are afraid of Christians, and Christians are afraid of gays. Each afraid that the other is going to get control of the government and impose alien values upon them. Blacks are afraid of white. Whites are afraid of black. The rich and the poor consider themselves opponents of each other because they're all fighting for a share of a fixed pie that the government is going to dole out. Young and, and old are in the same position. The old can get only what they want if it's taken away from the young and vice versa. And so everybody is an opponent of everybody else. We can't afford to be we can't afford to tolerate other viewpoints because those viewpoints are threatened to us. But in a free society, each person can have whatever he wants. There will be many, many choices. You go into a, a grocery store and there are six kinds of mayonnaise, eight kinds of mustard, all these different things, but it doesn't matter what anybody wants. You can get what you want. So we can all afford to be more civil to each other, more benevolent, more tolerant. And that's the kind of America I want to see. An America where nobody is telling other people what to do. And as long as
health care system, the charity system. They use it to destroy our freedom of choice in buying products or services or whatever it was we wanted. And they use our own money to try to destroy our society. And as a result today, America is no different from the America from the countries of the old world. You can't distinguish America in any particular way, in any important way from Germany or France or Sweden. And yet once this was the America that was symbolized by the Statue of Liberty, an America that was so unique that people from all over the world struggled to get here, somehow to be here, because they knew that once they were here, they would be free, sovereign individuals. No one would ask for your papers. No one would pass on a number on you. No one would extort a percentage of your income at the price of going to work. It was an America where you were free to pursue the life you'd always dreamed of. And I think that's the meaning behind the words that Emma Lazarus wrote that are now on the face of the Statue of Liberty. I know you've heard them often, and you may even have heard them from me before, but they never fail to touch me when I see them. Just as it never fails to touch me when I see the Statue of Liberty, because there is such meaning behind it. She wrote those words to say, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send me the tempest thought to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That is the America we once had. That is the America we should have. The, the beacon of liberty providing life and hope and inspiration for the entire world. And by God, I am determined that that is the America we will have again. Thank you very much.
put this policy in hands of your retirement. It's your future. Don't let politicians throw that away. Call now to receive a free packet of information or visit harrybrown.org. Harry Brown for Harry.
$10,000 worth of these ads each month on CNN, CNBC, and MSNBC. It reaches two and a half million American homes. And it reaches a whole lot of reporters who don't necessarily want to cover it, but need a chance to grow spiritually. So we're helping them. Well, I, I think it's very important to help them embrace the whole thing. Do me. 
National News Conference weekly, again and again and again, and nightly. And we want it to the point where these guys get sick of us and quit and bring libertarians on to replace them. <laughs> it's my fantasy. I'm going with it. We want the highest libertarian presidential vote in history so that every one of your family and friends will say, I saw your candidate. I like those ideas. Can you tell me more? Would you like that? What we're trying to do is make sure that happens. There's only one way to make sure it's happening. And I'm going to answer the question I ask everybody. What's the biggest newspaper in, in, in Austin? The American States. The American States. What? The Un-American States.
34 dollars and I don't know how many cents because he could not do it. And then he said, he said, go get it. But he can do that, can't we reach over there? And he's not alone. We get it from 68 years old. We had out in California, this woman comes with a perfectly coined hair blonde, so he had to have this Republican. <laughs> oh, no, you know the book. You know the book. <laughs> and an 11 year old young man, and he had a copy of Mary Brown's book, Why Government Doesn't Work. And he said, Well, Mr. Brown signed my book. I said, Sure. He said, Oh, I'm a libertarian. My mother's a Republican. I needed a rock. First of all, it's not constitutional. The 
federal government has no authority anyway. Can we turn that down a little? Uh, people in the next room are complaining. Okay. First of all, uh, uh, first of all, it's not constitutional. There is nothing in the Constitution that allows the federal government to be involved in law enforcement of any kind whatsoever. The only crimes that are mentioned in the Constitution are treason, piracy, and counterfeiting, and those are all committed by government employees. <laughs> anything of this sort, because this was meant by the founding fathers to be handled by, federal, by the state and local government. Because they were scared to death that we would have federal agencies like the DEA, the BATF, and others carrying guns that could impose their way upon the American people. If you live in a state where the, the law enforcement gets corrupt, you can move to the next state. But when the federal law enforcement is corrupt, there is no place you can move except out of the country. So it was designed, the federal system was designed to keep the federal government out of law enforcement. And when they uh, wanted to prohibit alcohol, they passed the constitutional amendment to do so. But they never did that uh, with the drug war. So first, it's unconstitutional. Second, it doesn't work like any government program. They pass a law and decide that that is all that is necessary for the problem is not solved. Whether they pass a law having to do with health care or standing on property or whatever it is. The drug war is no exception. They pass a law and they consider the drug war one. The fact is that drug use is far greater today than it was 30 years ago when the drug war started. The crime rate is far greater than it was when the drug war started. At the end of alcohol prohibition, crime immediately plummeted and kept going downward until the drug war started in the 1960s. The drug war transfers the distribution of drugs from pharmaceutical companies to criminal gangs who are willing to follow the law. Pharmaceutical companies do not go on to school grounds to hook kids on sleeping pills or aspirin, and they wouldn't try to do the same thing with heroin or cocaine or anything else. Criminal gangs do not care whom they hook on drugs. They are happy to get kids hooked on drugs, and so they are, uh, children are in much greater danger uh, under the present system than they would be if drugs were completely legal. It's hard for us to realize that before the First World War in this country, a 10-year-old girl could walk into a drugstore and buy heroin. Heroin was sold as a pain reliever and a sedative, just the way they are sold as for today in a package. And there was no prescription necessary, no note from one parent. But little girls didn't use heroin. Little girls had no interest in heroin. Older girls, older boys had no interest in heroin for two reasons. Number one, it was not a forbidden fruit. So they didn't buy it and take it behind the bar and use it in order to get back at their parents. And secondly, there were no criminal gangs that were trying to hook them on drugs. No criminal gang thing is not common. So the point is that we need to be afraid of drug legalization. America didn't become a, a nation of alcoholics when uh, alcohol prohibition ended. It won't become a nation of drug users when uh, drug prohibition ends. A uh, further effect is that, as I pointed out before, it is still our students with people who are no threat to anyone else and made it possible for violent criminals to be out on the streets with early release of plea bargains. In every conceivable way, the drug war has been a disaster to this country, and I think it is the greatest scourge that has ever been visited upon America. Far greater than any war, far greater than anything else. More people have probably died from the drug war than from any, any war that America has fought in its history. People who have dropped, died in drive-by cities, people who have died from taking drugs that are not pure, just as people died from bathtub gin during the 1920s. People who have died in prison, who never should have been there in the first place, and on and on we can go. If we care about this country, if we care about our children, if we care about the Constitution, we have to end this war. Because it is not a war on drugs, it is not even a war on drug users or drug dealers, it is a war on the American people, and it doesn't matter whether you have any interest in drugs yourself, and you are affected, you are a first party, and we must end it. And that is all I want.
first several terms during the 1970s, the Republican establishment opposed him. The Republican establishment has preferred an ex-Democrat who was still a Democrat in thinking, uh, but had just joined the Republican Party because the Republican Party now has control of Congress, and that was the better party to be in. He wanted to be on the winning team. So Ron Paul has not been welcomed into the, the body of Republicans. Ron Paul is opposed at every turn by the Republicans. Ron Paul has made no difference to the Republican Party at all. He has made a difference to us, and I'm glad that he is in Congress. I think he is a wonderful man, and I've known him for 20 years, and I am so glad that he's here in Congress, but he has not affected the Republican Party in any way whatsoever. Ever since Eisenhower's day, the Republicans who want a smaller government have been telling us that we could just elect a few more Republican congressmen. If we could just get a few more conservatives into the Republican Party, if we could just get control of the presidency and Congress at the same time, if we could just do this or just do that, we could finally do something to reduce government. We always the excuses, always the future, always the justifications for what they do, but the Republican Party is as corrupt as the Democratic Party, and when the Libertarian Party is one of the two major parties, it is probably the Republican Party that will die out. There will always be a market for a party that caters to people who want to meddle in other people's lives. And the Democratic Party does that so much better than the Republican Party. <laughs> no matter how the Republicans try to match them. But there will not always be a party whose only claim to fame is, we're not the Democrats. It needs something more than that, and I don't think the Republican Party will survive. Incidentally, it's an interesting thing that while George Bush has been running for the presidency for the last year, we have been told over and over and over again why we must support George Bush and why it's important. Uh, conservatives, the libertarians, others have been told why we must support George Bush. But with all of these programs and all these proposals that he's made, the only argument that people have been able to give as to why we should support George Bush is he's not Al Gore. For a year, that's what they've been telling us. And then two weeks ago, we watched the Republican convention and lo and behold, we find out he is out
we are growing and we are growing rapidly. That's why we're almost three times the size that we were four years ago. That's why we can run so many good candidates this year. That's why so many things are happening this year that didn't happen four years ago. That's why I said earlier that if nothing changes, within two or three years, we're going to hit a point where there's something going to explode. But I'd like to speed that up. But this is what has happened. So I don't think we need to feed with anybody. We don't need to feed with the press. We just keep going as we're going, and the point will come and these people will come to us. Does that make sense? Good. Yes, sir. What is the Libertarian Party position on the IMF and NATO and other global organizations? Uh, I think I speak for the Libertarian Party and certainly for the Libertarian platform when I say I believe the United States should get out of all international organizations. Or any of these others who have taken us into similar situations 
and created in their own way on a smaller scale just as bad consequences as Woodrow Wilson did in the First World War. We must get the United States to concentrate solely on the defense of this country and not on ruling the world. Have become more attractive and active 
government never did it. The government never did anything about the people that were polluting that were polluting his property. And of course they wouldn't because nobody has an interest in the future value of that property. And that's the key to it. Private owners generally do not pollute their own property because they're worried about the future value of the property. You're not going to let your house go to pot, you're not going to get your let your uh, lawn uh, die or any of these things because you intend to sell that property someday and you want to sell it as a profit, not a gigantic loss. So Boise Cascade takes immense care when it's forced to make sure that the insects don't get out, to make sure that the trees are replenished, that it's uh, planting more trees than it cuts down. But right next door to Boise Cascade is a government forest that is overrun by insects, a government forest that they lease out to private companies to come in and despoil in any way those companies want, because neither the government administrators or the private companies have any interest in the future value of that property. And lastly, the worst polluter of all is the United States government. And the funny thing is that one of the worst polluters within the United States government is the Environmental Protection Agency. It has plants all over the country, testing facilities, where they test various things, and as they do, they just dump the chemicals and the toxic waste in the nearby stream. Now, why would they do that? When they're supposed to be in charge of keeping the, the uh, lands and the rivers and the lakes pollution free? Because they can. Because they are exempt from all the laws that apply to all the rest of us. And so why should they bother? Why should they care? Who has an interest in it? We have to take these lands, these properties, out of the hands of government, put them in the hands of private owners who will care for them if we have any interest in the future of a, of a clean America. Does that help answer the question? Well, I believe that Boise Cascade would do a far better job than the government does. Yellowstone Park is an ecological disaster. I mean, there's sewage running through the rivers there, and these things that when people say, oh, my goodness, private companies would ruin it. How could they treat it any worse than it's being treated now? Because, again, nobody is held accountable for these things as government. It's the nature of government. Now, I believe that we should sell off all of the government land, the 70% of the land in the 13 Western states, put it out for auction over a six-year period, along with the hundreds of thousands of federal buildings, the unused military bases, the power companies, the pipelines, the oil rights, mineral rights, the commodity resources, all these things should be sold off. And use the first proceeds to buy private facilities for everybody who's dependent on Social Security today so that they're out of the system, so that they know they are safe, that they no longer are depending on political promises. Now, some people are not going to get it about the national parks. They're going to say, oh my God, you're going to turn Grand, uh, the Grand Canyon into a parking lot or something. As though whoever spent billions of dollars buying the Grand Canyon is going to try to get it all back selling parking spaces for a dollar an hour or something like that. Uh, it makes no sense at all. But I can understand that there might be tremendous political pressure against selling some of those national parks. So I would be willing, I imagine, if it seemed necessary, to say that those particular properties would only go to organizations like the Nature Conservancy or the Sierra Club or somebody else, who, whatever their failings or their virtues, would undoubtedly do a better job of protecting them than the government does. Yes, sir. They anticipate the demand and they get the planes 
there when they're needed. They, they fund more and more employees. But government airports are always years and years and years behind. And the government air traffic control system is 30 years out of date. They've got an antiquated computer system. So what happens? There isn't enough luggage facilities, so people wait for their baggage, sometimes interminable delays. There are never enough gates because the, the airports do not expand fast enough, so people get stuck sitting on runways waiting for a gate to open up. The air traffic control system has got the, the skies all messed up, so people are doing uh, circling air, airports endlessly, or they're waiting on a runway at another airport to take off because they're already full, but they can't land at the, the other end. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were on the runway at LaGuardia for four and a half hours. There were probably about 150 on the plane, and 148 of those people blamed the airlines. Only my wife and I understood that this was entirely a government problem. But, but this is typical of that. As president, I would make absolutely sure that there were no subsidies to uh, local governments to build airports, take out all of the favoritism that goes to those government airports, so that we could finally have the development of competing airports that would be produced by private companies making a profit. The airlines would welcome it, and they would quickly take their business to the private airports if such airports existed and were available. Let's take one more question before we get to it. Uh, what is my position on funding the government through voluntary donations? Governments are an agency of force. Uh, and they operate by force. Everything they do is to force people to do what they don't want to do, force them to pay for what they don't want to pay, and so on. I don't believe that you can finance such a thing voluntarily. As long as we have a government of force, uh, you cannot come focus on voluntary donations. Uh, the only, my view is the only good tax is a debt tax. But as long as we have a government, we are going to have taxes. And no such thing as a lottery or anything like that is going to work. Um, governments can run lotteries today only because they offer all the competition. And so they can devote maybe 50% of the revenue to uh, uh, programs like education and so on. But in Nevada, where the casinos are open and there's competition, those casinos operate on margins of 1 or 2%. No government could be uh, on 1 or 2% fund any program whatsoever. Would you want to say something further?
the diagnosis self esteem is too high. So I need a little bit of rejection. So you can help me out with this. Bye, Paul. Tell me came here tonight to see Harry Brown. Money is here, money is in it. 
we just put the Bible and say, uh, money is the value of capital. Folks, there's a lot of making money of God, making a, some kind of higher worship than that. Money builds churches, money keeps the poor, money builds your home, money educates your kids, money puts clothes on your back, and money helps you have a really good time. <laughs> but this money is going to liberty. This we like the torch and the staff for liberty to help show America the way through that dark night of big government. This money is going to make sure that the whole American people hear your idea. That you are. That no one, no one else will ever again say in your life, that's a fringe, weird idea. They'll say that is part of the American dialogue. This is part of the great political conversation in America. This is one voice in a chorus to try and remake America. And hopefully remake it in the image of that beautiful woman in the U.S. This money is helping to present our message our way. And I want you to know something from the bottom of my heart. I've been doing this a long time. I've raised better than five million dollars over the years. And every bit of it is going to build this part of our this liberty of ours. I tell people don't do it for your kids. I really do want you to do it for yourself. You can do it. Your whole life is deserve to be free, and this helps make it so. And I just want you to know something. When you look at the money, don't see money. See that statue over there. See freedom for yourself. And know that you deserve it. Most libertarians always like to get in the last word, and I'm not going to break that rule. I'm going to get in the last two words, and here they are. Thank you.
future is that you're president and what might be the next president. Well, the question is about the economic expansion and what the president can do. Uh, the president can only get the government out of the way. The government cannot make something happen. It can only prevent prosperity from taking place. We need to get the federal government out of the regulation business. We need to get the federal government out of business itself. We need to stop corporate welfare. We need to stop all of these, as the economists would say, misallocation of resources, whereby the government through its policy steers resources into areas where there is not a great public demand. And if we do that, and if we get rid of the federal reserve system so that we're back in a gold standard,
part in it really makes my heart warm to see all the people that showed up here tonight. It's fantastic. And I don't want to lose touch with any of you. So I want to see your faces again. So let me go through these announcements real quick. I know it's too late for everyone. But first of all, if you are from Williamson County, please meet back over there. Uh, I know some people have already uh, started to trail out, but if you're still here from Williamson County, back there because they're trying to organize. If you hear me in the back, okay, you might still get back there. Yeah. Uh, secondly, let me go ahead and introduce our least let me see the faces of uh, all of our candidates, our local candidates. We have more candidates running here in Travis County this election season than we ever have had. So let me introduce the ones that are here tonight and if uh, you're one of the candidates that is here tonight and I don't mention you, please jump up and wave your hands and see you. These are the ones that I've seen. Rock Howard. Rock. Yay! Thank you all. 